So Misha Dola um, is full professor in wireless communications at King's College London. And he drives uh, a kind of cross-disciplinary research and innovation in technology and sciences and even the arts. His work and research have resulted in pioneering practical aspects of cooperative communications. He's made substantial contributions to the fields of tactile internet, 5G systems, the internet of things and smart cities. His work has resulted in more than 200 highly cited peer-reviewed journal and conference papers. Dola introduced the concept of the Internet of Skills, which enables skills to be executed remotely using cutting-edge technologies such as tactile internet, artificial intelligence, and haptic encoders. He's also the first to introduce cross-disciplinary co-design into the 5G development framework. But his original ambition growing up was to become a professional pianist. And in fact, Dola has already released four albums on iTunes, and this morning we will be privileged to hear some music from his fifth album. He's been a featured speaker at numerous conferences through Europe, including the International Conference on Communications and the Wired Conference in London. He's also been a guest on shows like Ian King Live on the Sky News Channel and interviewed by outlets like the BBC and the Wall Street Journal. He's a fellow of the IEEE, the Royal Society of Arts, and a distinguished member of Leaders Excellence at Harvard Square. His presentation today will focus on the disruptive technology approaches in wireless 5G and next generation optical networks, which will allow us to break through that next technological barrier. So I'm really thrilled that he's joining us this morning, partly because he's a good friend, but also because this promises to be a fairly unique OFC plenary presentation. So I'd like you to join with me in welcoming our final plenary speaker this morning, Professor Misha Dola, and his presentation, Internet of Skills, where communications, robotics, and AI meet. Thank you, Misha. Good morning, yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the Internet has come a really long way. Uh, it took us decades to build, and, uh, you know, we have now every single uh, computer wired up on this planet, and we got every single smartphone connected, and shortly we will have probably trillions of devices uh, in that Internet. So we transited from a fixed Internet to a mobile internet, to a things internet in the end of the day. And I think it's a very timely question to ask, what's next? What is the next big internet uh, for which you provide an infrastructure? And uh, I got my inspiration a few years back, and that was at the midst of the Ebola crisis, uh, where King's College London was leading UK's response down in Sierra Leone. And we got some really hands-on knowledge what was going on down there. It was a situation of desperation, really, and uh, mainly caused by a total lack of medical skills down there. So I thought, why can't we combine our cutting-edge robotics with cutting-edge networking and a bit of really good AI and build an entirely new internet? An internet which would allow us to virtualize skills and transmit it from any point on the planet to our crisis areas. Now, I've worked on that concept for a while, and I gave it a name. I called it the Internet of Skills. And I thought, uh, once it's up and running, maybe in five years, maybe in ten years, it would democratize labor exactly the same way as the Internet has democratized knowledge and information. It would change the way how we engage, how our industries work. I could teach somebody how to play the piano, and somebody could teach me how to paint. And uh, you will wonder, how is that Internet, that Internet of Skills, different to the Internet we are designing, such as Industry 4.0? Well, the biggest difference, in my opinion, is I have the human in the loop. Because humans love humans in the end of the day. And despite our ability to automate everything we could probably automate, I don't think humanity's roadmap will be Industry 4.0. It will be rather something what I call uh, Human 4.0, uh, the ability to amplify our skills uh, by means of machines and AI, but not replacing the human. And you know, that observation, I got it after a very fascinating conversation with a very good friend of mine 
who happens to be one of the most senior pilots in British Airways, and he told me, Misha, you know, we could have flown airplanes 20 years ago fully automated, taken off, flying, landing. It's a really easy thing to do, and we would have had 10 times less accidents. We understand that. But he says, the only reason I'm getting into this cockpit every morning is because if I didn't, you wouldn't fly. You wouldn't trust these machines to bring you from one end of the world to the other, right? And uh, we essentially as humans trust humans to execute the job. And I think we will face actually the very same challenge with self-driving cars. Self-driving cars, let me, let me just you know, take this moment here and query this audience right now. Hands up everybody who was, would dare actually to sit in a self-driving car turn around and work whilst the car is driving you at 120 miles through the city. Hands up. Be honest. Now I have a very good photographic memory. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch you in a few years' time. I have you on my radar. Um, but you have seen what I've seen, right? It's just a few arms really have gone up in the end of the day. And uh, uh, we need something where the human actually could interact. So we work with the Transport for London on a concept called driving as a service, where in very precarious situations, actually humans would take over the driving. So that's from one end. On the other hand, you will say, you know, building a, an internet which allows me to transmit skills for touch and for kinesthetic movement, uh, muscle movement has been done before, right? All of us has been exposed to this in one way or another. And the answer is yes, and the answer is no. So we do have that equipment, and you see some of that here in the corner. It is a da Vinci robot used at King's College London to do robotic surgery. It is there. Okay? It is a no because we are not there yet where I want this network to be. And to exemplify this, I brought up the evolution of the internet because that's an evolution we all understand. Let's zoom backwards 50 years. Um, if you were lucky, you had a Siemens video phone, right? But to communicate with somebody on that video phone, that person also ha had to have a Siemens video phone. And if you're lucky, these phones were communicating over a circuit switched link. Most of, that, most of the time it's probably still manually switched, right? Now, zoom forward 50 years, we have done a, a lot of research, a lot of innovation, and I would like to highlight two. We have worked on the network. We introduced IP and all that great infrastructure which you guys have been designing over the decades. And something else we did, we came up with codecs. And these codecs, video and audio codecs, allow me today to take a video on my smartphone and play it on my Dell computer. We take that for granted, but what it actually enabled us to scale the edges and bring down the costs. And essentially, an underpinning internet, which is driving uh, parts of the economy of this part of the, of the millennium, right? So with the haptic networks, I'd love to do that very same transformation. Drive it out from something which is really uh, a propriety, right? Something where uh, a, a Da Vinci only works with a Da Vinci. A general electric uh, sensor only works with a general electric actuator. ABB, ABB, Siemens, Siemens. I want to break these out of the silos. And I want to scale it and bring the costs down. And there are two things we need to do very urgently, and we can't do that uh, over 40 years. We want to do that quicker because we know what we need to do. And the first thing is we need to come up with a really good network, ultra-low latency. I'll come to that in a moment. But we also need to come up with codecs, with new haptic codecs, which are able to understand each other's technology. So this glove here, this tactile glove from NeuroDigital, is able to talk to a general electric actuator. This is where I would like this network to go, and uh, therefore build a truly standardized internet of skills uh, enabling these service economies at scale. Now, what do we need from a tech point of view? Well, that's what you see is very simple, really. You see on one end, one or several human operators communicating uh, through one or several networks and reaching one or several slave devices which are performing a certain task. That's what it is. Now, the fascinating thing is if you want to transmit touch, like I have it on this glove here, um, you actually do not need a network where 
which is very low delay because touch is something we have a lot of latency on. It takes about 120 milliseconds between me touching the end of my finger and that actually reaching my brain. So the really interesting thing comes in when I start to move things. Kinesthetic muscle movement, I want to execute something, do an operation, I want to move a box, I want to do something on the other side of the planet, and this is when you need an ultra low latency network because action and reaction has to happen with, within about 10 milliseconds. Right? If you don't do that within 10 milliseconds, systems become unstable and we as humans also become what we call cyber dizzy. So here we are, we have advanced now quite a bit in terms of the technology and let me start with the haptic codex. So I've personally insisted that we ramped up within the IEEE an, an entirely new standards group which uh, only deals with an haptic codec. Uh, again, I'm trying to break the silos here and make sure that future equipment can talk to each other uh, without any problems. So please join that standards group if you are interested in, wor in the work. It's IEEE P1918.1. Um, we have also advanced the AI. You need quite a bit of AI. We call it model-mediated teleoperation system. And what we want to do here is, is to have the, uh, the slave side predict what the actuation side, the human, is going to do, and the human side predict what the slave environment is going to do. So the action and reaction is being predicted on both ends using advanced artificial intelligence. Now, we don't need that prediction over seconds. We need that prediction of, over maybe 10, 20, 50, 100 milliseconds. And the reason is because we want to stabilize it. Remember, I'm not building a local area network. I'm building an internet. It has to work from London to Los Angeles and back. Speed of light is one, one thing we can't beat. So we need uh, these type of AI systems to stabilize the delay. And then the network, well, that's why, that's why we're here today, really. This is our cup of tea as a community, and on the wireless edge, we're working very much on what we call the tactile internet, which is an ultra-low delay wireless interface, which involves 5G, but also more than that. And then we have the optical network, which you guys represent. Now, let me do a deep dive on the challenges. So the biggest challenge, arguably, is delay. I explain it. Delay is really driving these type of Internet of Skills applications, and uh, there are four constituents of delay, the speed of light, the serialization delay, then there's a congestion in the buffers, and there's the application layer delay. So all of that is needed because really what matters is the delay from application to application, and the constituents are right here. Now let's look at the different scenarios. You see here the human vortex type of reaction is about 10 million seconds. So the time it takes for my eye to take a visual signal, process that, and stabilize the image. And that's our reference point because if I want to have the human in the loop, I need to be running on these 10 millisecond cycles, right? So that's what we have there as a calibration point. Industrial local area networks, Industry 4.0, we are there. We can do 10 milliseconds today and hopefully 5G will enable also part of the wireless connectivity to enable the 10 milliseconds. Now what about a poor metro metropolitan area network with a lot of serialization switches, etc. So you get it now a delay here which can't handle the 10 milliseconds anymore. Let's put now an application on top, such as video or anything else you really want to put on top uh, and do a connection between the UK and let's say Frankfurt and Germany. Now you see delay, speed of light is still negligible, it's about 3 milliseconds, but the uh, buffer and congestion delays are very high. We can measure that uh, uh, using internet tools. And of course, application is introducing a massive delay. Now let's drive this further and say, hey, can we connect London with Los Angeles uh, using the, the type of Internet of Skills applications on top? And here's where we really struggle. Speed of light, it's nothing you can do about. A lot of congestion on the way, and the application is introducing, again, a massive delay on that. As I said before, the model-mediated AI can essentially bring down that delay by about 100 milliseconds to stabilize that, but we're still a very long way to go. So if you guys could help us with the buffer side, with the congestion side, and ideally do you know, a lot, if not all the routing actually at optical layer, not in the RF uh, kind of switches, so richly the routing is done in optical domain, that would be a great value add because we could forget about the yellow boxes pretty much immediately. So it's one of the homeworks I'd love to give. I know it works in the labs, but I'd like you to make it commercial. The other challenge is on the application delay, on the application delay, really. 
and it becomes very quickly a bandwidth challenge. And I want to exemplify that by, the, by, the, uh, by using video. So any of the modalities you would transmit in the Internet of Skills, video would always be there. But now the video is not like Skype. We didn't have 200 milliseconds to do that. We have to do really uh, 10 millisecond type of stuff across the planet. Now, how do you do that? Well, you struggle really to use con con uh, a traditional type of encoders uh, because the video encoders take a lot of time to do the encoding, partially because the hardware isn't powerful enough, partially because they need to look into some subframes coming later in time to do a perfect encoding. So you can have hardware today to get you a very good video compression within milliseconds, but it's very expensive. Remember, I'm trying to build an internet which is cheap and which scales. And the edges will always go as cheap as possible to bring essentially the problems back to you as a community and come up with a good network. So therefore, to bring down the delay, the only thing we can do is just don't encode it at all. Right? So what CMOS comes out of the uh, CMOS cameras, it's being unencoded, transmitted over the network. Once you do that, your data traffic just really goes through the roof, right? So something, a high defi definition, full HD video normally would consume at uh, 10 megabits per second, suddenly becomes 100 megabits per second. Uh, something which is, uh, you know, my, my 8K video, uh, it's about uh, 100 megabits per second goes to a gigabyte. And I'm, I don't want to talk about virtual reality. We'll see something later on. You can talk to, uh, to Richard about this later on. Gigantic uh, data rates being pumped forth and back in the network, right? So, and here's a problem because um, a, lo a lot, if not all the predictions I have seen on the internet traffic evolving over the years, the famous Cisco, uh, um, the Cisco predictions, they assume these video codecs to work on these 100 millisecond horizons to give us a good compression. Now, if you just take 1% of the future internet traffic to be uncompressed, suddenly your rate is double. If you take 10%, suddenly your rate is 10 times more. So there's a huge data, a data flood coming here, which isn't following the traditional uh, prediction from Cisco. It's actually an order of magnitude above this. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is, is that you have a lot of work to do uh, to help us to essentially get around that. Good news, right? But we're fighting our own challenges, really, in the wireless community. And I want to underpin that with uh, what we call Cooper's Law. So Cooper, Martin Cooper, one of the pioneers of mobile telephony, he established that capacity on the wireless edge doubles approximately every 18 months. And we managed to boost that capacity over the last 35 years by a factor of 1 million. Now, if you zoom in, and this is a little bit of an untold secret here, the physical layer has contributed by a factor of 5. The spectrum we're using has contributed by a factor of 25. And uh, fasten your seat belts, it is a smaller cell which has contributed by a whooping factor of 1,600. 1,600 by simply making the cells smaller, right? So if you see that and you compare that to the physical layer, physical layer has an impact of 0.3%. Why do we bother to dispute if we should use LDBC coding or Tobo coding? You see the problem? Right? The problem is elsewhere. We as engineers have got stuck in the physical air trying to come up as closely as possible to the, to the Shannon limit where the problem was actually in a, dis, in a totally different field. Now, if it's an architecture problem, then suddenly you can do a lot more things. So one of the concepts we pioneered at King's College London is the notion of the decoupled up and down link. So when you do your phone call today, the up and the down link come from the very same base station. Now we said, hey, if really small cells is the future and it's going to get smaller and smaller, there will be loads of those. Why do we need up and down link on the very same link? Let's decouple that. So we figured out that having the down link from a macro cell and the up link to a micro cell here in the room uh, fundamentally changes the dynamics in the system. Capacity goes up by order of magnitude. And above all, reliability and stability uh, takes, uh, uh, improves by a factor of 10, if not 100, right? So with that type of ability, we suddenly need a very strong optical network because we need the front hall to manage all that decoupled layer one or layer two type of traffic, right? So you, again, what I'm trying to emphasize here is a lot of work on the horizon which comes due to the decoupled architecture. Right, so where are we today? 
in terms of deployment? Well, we felt that as a community, we are ready to play. We are ready to deploy pre-commercial and commercial. And we said, hey, let's do something really bold and build maybe the world's largest end-to-end -end 5G uh, system in the United Kingdom. And uh, it's a pioneering development, which has been uh, founded by three partners. The first one is the 5GIC University of Surrey, and you see uh, uh, Professor Rahim Tafazoli, who has been absolutely instrumental in uh, bootstrapping that relationship and enticing the UK government to lose a lot of money for these type of developments. We also have uh, Bristol, University of Bristol, and Bristol's open in the game, and the sole and the really pioneering heart behind this is Dimitra, who is sitting right here in front of me. Uh, she has been also instrumental in coming up with a lot of the pioneering visions of that concept. And then there's my 100 people center in London working on the 5G and big data story. Now, what we're trying to do here really is, first of all, each of us has their own little sand pit. We're rolling out 5G stuff, including uh, mobile networks, a core network, as well as the fixed network. We're going to try to, we're going to trial the uh, 5G radio interface on the three pioneering bands that 700 megahertz, 3.5 gig, and 26 gig. Uh, we are ramping up totally new uh, front hauling technology, cloud run with functional splits. And on the networking side, core network, we do a lot on the super convergence between Wi-Fi uh, as well as RGBP technologies. So we want to bring this out, partially our equipment, university's equipment, and it's partially going to be also the vendor's equipment. And the next thing we want to do is we want to connect it, and we're going to use something which Dimitra pioneered, an ingenious idea to use something what we refer as, or she refers to as the SDN switch. Imagine it being like a marketplace, a marketplace between SDN connectivity and policy frameworks where we can bind in any type of partner in a totally flexible way. It all meets in Slough, which is our high computing and high speed uh, network in the United Kingdom. Right? So what we want to do next is also we want to bring in uh, third parties. We want to bring in more universities, more vendors, national and international. So if you want to participate in that, if there's anything you would like to test in a real environment uh, in downtown London, on Bristol, or on Guildford, please drop us an email either, or to Dimitri or myself or to Rahim, and you're most welcome to participate in that. Right, so let's look what we're going to do with that because the ultimate question remains, why do we do all that technology? And um, I'm showing here some graphs, so really the truth is there are maybe three, three reasons why we're doing all that. The first reason is we want, to have, we want to have a lot of fun, right? We want to celebrate science, we want to celebrate technology, something we do far too little. So I'm trying very hard to get my staff involved in real projects in London with the National Theatre, the Royal Opera, with uh, the op centres in, in, in London, the Transport for London, etc. So they get a hands-on experience on what's going on out there. The second thing we want to do is, what I want to do is, I want to make sure that we involve all these industries which are going to be using our technology in 5-10 years' time, will not question the cost and they will appreciate the value of the technology delivering whatever needs to be delivered. So involving them very early in co-designs is absolutely instrumental in making this, this happen, right? And the third thing we want to make is really transform these industries, make them 10 times better, make them really competitive, make them very attractive. That's what we are really try after. So, in, you know, I started in London with uh, a few industries, those which either Kings is very interested in, uh, very good at, uh, London itself is very good at, or in general, it's an industry which just couldn't miss. So you see a few examples here, like cities, work a lot with uh, Transport for London. Uh, you see the gaming community. So we just built, demonstrated at the Mobile World Congress a, a mobile Edge Cloud and the virtual machine, which is migrating in handover procedures through London, where all the heavy graphics rendering of these next generation games is done in the cloud and being streamed down like Netflix on your small device. So you can have high end PlayStation 4 and 5 games on very low end devices. We have demonstrated that. And arguably, the more interesting one on the arts and on the health sector. So you see here on that slide, you see Procar, and uh, he's operating. He is a pioneer in robotic surgery. Robotic surgery means it's not anymore the surgeon who's doing the, the operation. It's actually a robot which goes in the body on a very, very small keyhole. Uh, the operation itself takes a little bit longer, but you don't lose any blood. 
So the patient, instead of recuperating for seven days in the hospital, can go home pretty much immediately. So it's a huge business case to the healthcare system in the United Kingdom and around the globe. And uh, Proca is uh, uh, luckily a professor at King's College in London. King's owns four hospitals. It's very easy for me to communicate with him and say, hey, let's do something together. And he gave me homework. He said, Misha, solve me three problems. Problem number one is when I do the operation, I can't feel. Because before when I was uh, literally in the patient, I could feel. Now I can't. There's a metal rod in there. Second thing is, if I could operate from a North London hospital whilst the patient is in a South London hospital, that would be great because uh, the commute through London is killing me. And the third thing he said, please help me with the training of my stuff. It comes back to the Internet of Skills. He can only train one person after one person. If that person isn't good enough, two months have been in vain. If we could digitize that skill of the operation, we could save it in a database, and we could actually replay it a little bit like Netflix anytime we want to do that. Right? So that would be a big thing. So we did it. We just built the whole thing. We essentially gave Proca the feeling of touch, the ability to do the operation remotely, and record the skill set needed to do these medical operations. And we had a, a, a great the Mobile World Congress where we demonstrated that. And there were a few worlds first, really. One of the worlds first was we developed a sensor, my Jason Robotics Department um, at King's, a sensor so susceptible it would actually detect cancer two centimeters under your skin. Right? So you as a human, no matter how susceptible you are, going over the skin, you can't detect it. That sensor can do it. It's kind of X-Men type of capabilities. So we did that. Small sensor, very cheap, uh, scalable to the billions, no problem. We also build in the touch thing. So that's a haptic glove here. Um, you can't feel it, but I can feel it. I can feel things here. That glove allows me to feel rain, tissue, whatever I want to do. We connected that through a 5G real-time sliced architecture to really ensure that the stream is of highest quality between the two ends. And we brought in, of course, a virtual reality capability uh, through Opto, which you will see later on here, the world's first real-time uh, virtual reality. The stitching time, so between screen and screen, is less than a millisecond. Nobody has done that before. Normally, the quickest you have like three seconds, maybe a second. We had less than a millisecond to put it all together. So, give a fully immersive virtual operating theater uh, to Proca, and he could execute these operations from anywhere where he wanted to. Now, I'm going to show you a video and I'm going to talk you through some of these constituents. So, what you see here is uh, Costas moving the robotic arm and being in the operating theater with the VR equipment. That's a touch device which was just here, the 360 cameras, uh, the six GoPros which we have on here as well. And uh, you could feel essentially the inside the body. Here's a body uh, mock-up. There's a robotic surgery tool going inside the body. You see the sensor at the very end, very small miniature sensor, um, essentially picking up these signals, cancerous tissue at an extremely high precision, testing over the field, and people essentially being part of that operating theater. Very simple to use, a virtual reality kit. And here Costa is one of my staff members really helping with the deployment. So it was a, it was quite an, uh, quite a successful really Mobile World Congress for us where we showed essentially the world's first um, uh, remote operating capabilities of a 5G SDN sliced uh, architecture. Right, so after we've done the medical, we said, hey, let's move on now to the, um, let's move on to the arts. That's very close to my heart. So you have heard that, uh, you know, my ambition was always to be in the music industry, really. The, uh, what we wanted to, when I joined the center in London, I asked my people a very simple question. I said, guys, what does it take to disrupt the performing arts world exactly the same way as, we, as Netflix has disrupted TV. If you think about it, Netflix has changed the way how we consume content. Today we can watch a film anywhere we want, on any device we want, at any time we want. But interestingly, and maybe that has escaped your attention, Netflix has also changed the way uh, content is being procured. A series like Stranger Things has come up without going through the traditional Hollywood ranks. It's been, in a sense, almost a crowdsourced type of application. That's what Netflix has given us. It has empowered us as a viewer. 
and it has empowered the acting industry uh, to essentially uh, become a, a world player. Now, the question we ask is, could we do the same now in the arts world? What would it take to give a full immersive uh, feeling or experience to anybody watching an uh, opening keynote, Madonna playing, uh, the opening of the Olympics? Could we virtualize audiences, real audiences? Could we virtualize stages with actors, real actors? Could we virtualize the musicians, some real musicians, bring it all together, create some new art forms? That's the big question we ask. If you look at the whole art sector, it's extremely conservative. It's actually one of the most conservative verticals I know of. It hasn't been disrupted since the times of Shakespeare, right? And arguably since the times of the, of the, of the Greeks. So I think it's time for, to do something with them. And of course, we have tried as a community, network performance has been tried for the last 20 years. But we couldn't really solve it, all right? Because the network wasn't good enough, or the piece of art wasn't good enough. So we went together with uh, Ali Hosseini, who's a really well-known American artist, with the National Theater, with the Young Vic, and other really high-profile uh, high venues in the United Kingdom, and tried to come up with something where technology and the arts are merged into one thing, right? And uh, I could show you a video, but I decided to actually take a bit further and do a live demo, take the risk on that. In fact, it's a package. There are going to be two live demos today and one launch. So I'm launching my fifth album today. The uh, record label just told me it's been distributed globally on every single music platform on the planet. Uh, so if you happen to be on iTunes, Music Play, uh, or on, on Spotify, uh, please follow me. It would really make my day in a sense. And uh, so I'm launching that today officially. And by, I'm going to do that by um, uh, essentially bringing on two pieces here. And the uh, two pieces are going to be first a slow piece. Uh, it's Ouroboros. It's my opening piece uh, of my fifth album. I composed it for Ali who's been using it for his exhibition called uh, Ouroboros. And um, uh, I'm going to be using a haptic glove, which essentially uh, is going to reproduce my movement on the piano. And you're going to see not only the rendered hand, you're also going to see the vector graphics of my skill vectors. So we can, the ambition is to record that, store it, standardize it, and replay that in a sense on the, uh, uh, on the, on the, um, uh, on any piano or exoskeleton you want to use that. So the people who helped me read a lot in, on that type of project is, is Laura, and Laura is from uh, Music for Mental uh, Wealth. She's going to help me to put on that glove, really. Um, one second, Laura, we're going to get there in a moment, right? So she's, been used, she's going to be using some of that technology to, in one of her really exciting ventures, which you're most welcome to talk to her about in the break. I'm also having uh, Richard with me. He's a CEO of uh, Opto, the virtual reality company. So if you guys maybe could start setting up this stuff already. So there's going to be the second part is going to be with our 5G slicing uh, architecture. So first part is the glove. Second part is a quicker piece, which um, uh, is uh, t called Timeless Memories. And I'm going to show you there are two video streams, and I hope it still works. Sometimes it freezes. One stream is a 5G slice stream where you really have a total control of the buffer so we can guarantee the slicing across, uh, across the network. And one is the traditional best effort type of uh, traffic. So let's get that going. I had to recompose that first piece in the airplane because I thought I'm going to be using this glove, but it turns out I was shipped on Friday a slightly larger um, glove. Um, yeah, good one. Which is thicker. So I had a lot of the keys essentially black and white and got stuck on the, uh, with the actual glove. Let me just put this up. <clears throat> We want to film that, right? So let's see if we can put this on. Are you excited? Yeah. <laughs> so I have to say, I'm not a professional pianist, right? I'm an aspiring professional composer, which is very different, but here you go. We'll give it a shot, right? So why not? Okay, let's see, Laurie. So this one needs to be go lower. Yeah, here. Right, okay, right. Is it on? Yeah, it should be on. A bit tighter, maybe. Yeah. All 
All right. Good. So now we need to calibrate that. If I could have the calibration on the um, on the screen here, can you have a look if we can get it? Is it up and running? Oh, sorry. I need to log in. Type in passwords with thick gloves. I hope it works. We just have a look because otherwise it takes too long. Yeah. All right. Good, Brent. So we need to calibrate that. Uh, don't forget to bring in the vectors here. <coughs> All right. So I hope this is how we did it. Yeah. All right. Uh, could you bring in the vectors? Yeah. So what you see here is the um, <coughs> is essentially the, gra the the hand which is rendered. Sorry. Can you move the the, no, the cursor just to get it off? Yep. So what you see here is a real-time calibrated, uh, uh, rendered, graphically rendered hand. It's very volatile, so we men, may end up with the hand being out of the screen, but it's done in real time. And you also see the, uh, the actual vectors, the skill vectors. Do you see how they move, right? So we're gonna, that's being recorded in real time as well. So let's see if we can get this going. I don't have a memory too, so I'm going to record that on my own 360. All right, let's go. <laughs> so I may get stuck in the keys, right? Uh, I'll see how that goes. <clears throat> Right. <laughs> All right. So now the second piece. I hope the uh, three six uh, the two cameras. Right. So what you see now is is um, the real time three sixty virtual reality feed, which uh, Peter is seeing whilst he is sitting on that chair here. I hope he doesn't get too dizzy. And we do have uh, two video streams there where I see already one is frozen. I do apologize. That's what happens with uh, real demos, right? So the one which is working here, right, is the real-time sliced virtual machine here, which is guaranteeing the path, uh, in this case, emulated to go through London. And the other one is a best effort, which unfortunately already froze. So let's give it a try. All right. <clears throat>
right. Thanks. That's it. <laughs>